Turin in Doria. In the years of his childhood in the kingdom of Doria, Turin was watched over by Melian, though he saw her seldom. But there was a maiden named Nellas, who lived in the woods, and at Melian's bidding she would follow Turin if he strayed in the forest, and often she met him there, as it were by chance. From Nellas Turin learned much concerning the ways and the wild things of Doriath, and she taught him to speak the Sindarin tongue after the manner of the ancient realm, older and more courteous, and richer in beautiful words. Elsewhere my father remarked that the speech of Doriath, whether of the king or others, was even in the days of Turin more antique than that used elsewhere, and also that Meme observed, though the extant writings concerning Meme do not mention this, that one thing of which Turin never rid himself, despite his grievance against Dariath, was the speech he had acquired during his fostering. Thus for a little while his mood was lightened, until he fell again under shadow, and that friendship passed like a morning of spring. For Nellas did not go to Menegroth, and was unwilling ever to walk under roofs of stone, so that as Turin's boyhood passed and he turned his thoughts to the deeds of men, he saw her less and less often, and at last called for her no more. But she watched over him still, though now she remained hidden. A marginal note in one text says here, Always he sought in all faces of women, the face of Lalith. Nine years Turin dwelt in the halls of Menegroth. His heart and thought turned ever to his own kin, and at times he had tidings of them for his comfort. For Thingol sent messengers to Morwen as often as he might, and she sent back words for her son. Thus Turin heard that his sister Neonor grew in beauty, a flower in the grey north and that Morwen's plight was eased. And Turin grew in stature until he became tall among men, and his strength and hardihood were renowned in the realm of Thingol. In those years he learned much law, hearing eagerly the histories of ancient days, and he became thoughtful and sparing in speech. Often Beleg Strongbow came to Menegroth to seek him, and led him far afield teaching him woodcraft and archery, and, which he loved best, the handling of swords. But in crafts of making he had less skill, for he was slow to learn his own strength, and often marred what he made with some sudden stroke. In other matters also it seemed that fortune was unfriendly to him, so that often what he designed went awry, and what he desired he did not gain. Neither did he win friendship easily for he was not merry, and laughed seldom, and a shadow lay on his youth. Nonetheless he was held in love and esteem by those who knew him well, and he had honour as the fosterling of the king. Yet there was one that begrudged him this, and ever the more as Turin drew nearer to manhood, Cyros, son of Ithilbor, was his name. He was of the Nandor, being one of those who took refuge in Doriath after the fall of their lord Denethor upon Ammon Ereb in the first battle of Beleriand. These elves dwelt for the most part in Arthurian, between Aros and Kelon in the east of Doriath, wandering at times over Kelon into the wild lands beyond. And they were no friends to the Edain since their passage through Assyriand and settlement in Estelad. But Cyros dwelt mostly in Menegroth, and won the esteem of the king, and he was proud, dealing haughtily with those whom he deemed of lesser state and worth than himself. He became a friend of Dairon the minstrel, for he also was skilled in song, and he had no love for men, and least of all for any kinsman of Beren Erhamion. In one variant text of this section of the narrative, Cyros is said to have been the kinsman of Dairon, and in another, Dairon's brother. The text printed is probably the latest. Is it not strange, said he, 
that this land should be opened to yet another of this unhappy race. Did not the other do enough harm in Doriath? Therefore he looked askance on Turin and on all that he did, saying what ill he could of it. But his words were cunning and his malice veiled. If he met with Turin alone, he spoke haughtily to him and showed plain his contempt, and Turin grew weary of him, though for long he returned ill words with silence. For Cyros was great among the people of Doriath and a counsellor of the king. But the silence of Turin displeased Cyros as much as his words. In the year that Turin was seventeen years old, his grief was renewed, for all tidings from his home ceased at that time. The power of Morgoth had grown yearly, and all Hithlum was now under his shadow. Doubtless he knew much of the doings of Hurin's kin and had not molested them for a while so that his design might be fulfilled. But now in pursuit of this purpose he set a close watch upon all the passes of the shadowy mountains, so that none might come out of Hithlum nor enter it, save at great peril. And the orcs swarmed about the sources of Narog and Taglin, and the upper waters of Sirion. Thus there came a time when the messengers of Thingol did not return, and he would send no more. He was ever loath to let any stray beyond the guarded borders, and in nothing had he shown greater goodwill to Hurin and his kin than in sending his people on the dangerous roads to Morwen in Dorlomin. Now Turin grew heavy-hearted, not knowing what new evil was afoot, and fearing that an ill fate had befallen Morwen and Neonor and for many days he sat silent, brooding on the downfall of the house of Hador and the men of the north. Then he rose up and went to seek Thingol, and he found him sitting with Melian under Hirilorn, the great beach of Menegroth. Thingol looked on Turin in wonder, seeing suddenly before him in the place of his fosterling a man and a stranger, tall, dark-haired, looking at him with deep eyes and a white face. Then Turin asked Thingol for mail, sword, and shield, and he reclaimed now the dragon helm of Dor Lomin, and the king granted him what he sought, saying, I will appoint you a place among my knights of the sword, for the sword will ever be your weapon. With them you may make trial of war upon the marches, if that is your desire. But Turin said, Beyond the marches of Doriath my heart urges me. I long rather for assault upon the enemy than for defence of the borderlands. Then you must go alone, said Thingol. The part of my people in the war with Angband I rule according to my wisdom, Turin son of Hurin. No force in the arms of Doriath will I send out at this time, nor in any time that I can yet foresee. Yet you are free to go as you will, son of Morwen, said Melian. The girdle of Melian does not hinder the going of those that passed in with our leave. Unless wise counsel will restrain you, said Thingol. What is your counsel, lord? said Turin. A man you seem in stature, Thingol answered. But nonetheless you have not come to the fullness of your manhood that shall be. When that time comes, then, maybe, you can remember your kin. But there is little hope that one man alone can do more against the Dark Lord than to aid the Elf Lords in their defence, as long as that may last. Then Turin said, Beren, my kinsman, did more. Beren and Luthien, said Melian. But you are overbold to speak so to the father of Luthien. Not so high is your destiny, I think, Turin, son of Morwen, though your fate is twined with that of the elven folk for good or for ill. Beware of yourself, lest it be ill. Then after a silence she spoke to him again, saying, Go now, foster son, and heed the counsel of the king. 
yet I do not think that you will long abide with us in Doriath after the coming of manhood. If in days to come you remember the words of Melian, it will be for your good. Fear both the heat and the cold of your heart. Then Turin bowed before them and took his leave. And soon after he put on the dragon helm and took arms, and went away to the north marches, and was joined to the elven warriors who there waged unceasing war upon the orcs and all servants and creatures of Morgoth. Thus, while yet scarcely out of his boyhood, his strength and courage were proved. And remembering the wrongs of his kin, he was ever forward in deeds of daring, and he received many wounds by spear or arrow or the crooked blades of the orcs. But his doom delivered him from death, and word ran through the woods and was heard far beyond Doriath that the dragon helm of Dorlomin was seen again. Then many wondered, saying, Can the spirit of Hador or of Galdor the Tall return from death? Or has Hurin of Hithlum escaped indeed from the pits of Angband? One only was mightier in arms among the march wardens of Thingol at that time than Turin, and that was Beleg Cuthalion. And Beleg and Turin were companions in every peril, and walked far and wide in the wild woods together. Thus three years passed, and in that time Turin came seldom to Thingol's halls, and he cared no longer for his looks or his attire, but his hair was unkempt and his mail covered with a grey cloak stained with the weather. But it chanced in the third summer, when Turin was twenty years old, that desiring rest and needing smithwork for the repair of his arms, he came unlooked for to Menegroth in the evening, and he went into the hall. Thingol was not there, for he was abroad in the greenwood with Melian, as was his delight at times in the high summer. Turin went to a seat without heed, for he was wayworn and filled with thought. And by ill luck he set himself at a board among the elders of the realm, and in that very place where Cyros was accustomed to sit. Cyros, entering late, was angered, believing that Turin had done this in pride and with intent to affront him. And his anger was not lessened to find that Turin was not rebuked by those that sat there, but welcomed among them. For a while, therefore, Cyros feigned to be of like mind, and took another seat facing Turin across the board. Seldom does the march warden favour us with his company, he said, and I gladly yield my accustomed seat for the chance of speech with him. And much else, he said to Turin, questioning him concerning the news from the borders and his deeds in the wild. But though his words seemed fair, the mockery in his voice could not be mistaken. Then Turin became weary, and he looked about him and knew the bitterness of exile. And for all the light and laughter of the elven halls, his thought turned to Beleg and their life in the woods, and thence far away to Morwen in Dorlomin in the house of his father. And he frowned because of the darkness of his thoughts and made no answer to Cyrus. At this, believing the frown aimed at himself, Cyrus restrained his anger no longer, and he took out a golden comb and cast it on the board before Turin, saying, Doubtless, man of Hithlum, you came in haste to this table, and may be excused your ragged cloak. But you have no need to leave your head untended as a thicket of brambles. And perhaps if your ears were uncovered, you would hear better what is said to you. Turin said nothing, but turned his eyes upon Cyros, and there was a glint in their darkness. But Cyros did not heed the warning, and returned the gaze with scorn, saying for all to hear, If the men of Hithlum are so wild and fell, of what sort are the women of that land? Do they run like deer, clad only in their hair? Then Turin took up a drinking vessel and cast it in Cyrus's face, and he fell backward with great hurt. And Turin drew his sword and would have run at him, 
that Mablong the hunter who sat at his side restrained him. Then Cyros rising spat blood upon the board and spoke from a broken mouth. How long shall we harbour this Woodwoes? Woodwoes, wild man of the woods. This is discussed later in the chapter concerning the Druidine. Who rules here tonight? The king's law is heavy upon those who hurt his lieges in the hall, and for those who draw blades there, outlawry is the least doom. Outside the hall I could answer you, Woodwoes. But when Turin saw the blood upon the table, his mood became cold, and releasing himself from Mablung's grasp, he left the hall without a word. Then Mablung said to Cyros, What ails you tonight? For this evil I hold you to blame, and it may be that the king's law will judge a broken mouth a just return for your taunting. If the cub has a grievance, let him bring it to the king's judgment, answered Cyros. But the drawing of swords here is not to be excused for any such cause. Outside the hall, if the wood woes draws on me, I shall kill him. That seems to me less certain, said Mablung. But if either be slain, it will be an evil deed more fit for Angban than Doriath, and more evil will come of it. Indeed, I think that some shadow of the north has reached out to touch us tonight. Take heed, Cyros, son of Ithilbor, lest you do the will of Morgoth in your pride, and remember that you are of the Eldar. I do not forget it, said Cyros. But he did not abate his wrath, and through the night his malice grew, nursing his injury. In the morning, when Turin left Menegroth to return to the north marches, Cyros waylaid him running out upon him from behind with drawn sword and shield on arm. But Turin, trained in the wild to wariness, saw him from the corner of his eye, and leaping aside he drew swiftly and turned upon his foe. Morwen, he cried, now your mocker shall pay for his scorn. And he clove Cyros's shield, and then they fought together with swift blades. But Turin had been long in a hard school, and had grown as agile as any elf, but stronger. He soon had the mastery, and wounding Cyros's sword arm, he had him at his mercy. Then he set his foot on the sword that Cyros had let fall. Cyros, he said, there is a long race before you, and clothes will be a hindrance. Hair must suffice. And suddenly throwing him to the ground, he stripped him, and Cyros felt Turin's great strength and was afraid. But Turin let him up, and then, Run! he cried. Run! And unless you go as swift as the deer, I shall prick you on from behind. And Cyros fled into the wood, crying wildly for help. But Turin came after him like a hound, and however he ran or swerved, still the sword was behind him to egg him on. The cries of Cyros brought many others to the chase, and they followed after, but only the swiftest could keep up with the runners. Mablung was in the forefront of these, and he was troubled in mind, for though the taunting had seemed evil to him, malice that wakes in the morning is the mirth of Morgoth ere night. And it was held moreover a grievous thing to put any of the elven folk to shame self-willed, without the matter being brought to judgment. None knew at that time that Turin had been assailed first by Cyros who would have slain him. Hold, hold, Turin, he cried. This is orc work in the woods. But Turin called back, Orc work in the woods for orc words in the hall, and sprang again after Cyros. And he, despairing of aid and thinking his death close behind, ran wildly on, until he came suddenly to a brink where a stream that fed Esgalduin flowed in a deep cleft through high rocks, and it was wide for a deer leap. There Cyros, in his great fear, attempted the leap. But he failed of his footing on the far side and fell back with a cry and was broken on a great stone in the water. So he ended his life in Doriath, and long would Mandos hold him. Turin looked down on his body lying in the stream and he thought, Unhappy fool! From here I would have let him walk back to Menegroth. 
Now he has laid a guilt upon me, undeserved. And he turned and looked darkly on Mablung and his companions, who now came up and stood near him on the brink. Then after a silence Mablung said, Alas, but come back now with us, Turin, for the king must judge these deeds. But Turin said, If the king were just, he would judge me guiltless. But was not this one of his counsellors? Why should a just king choose a heart of malice for his friend? I abjure his law and his judgment. Your words are unwise, said Mablung, though in his heart he felt pity for Turin. You shall not turn runagate. I bid you return with me as a friend, and there are other witnesses. When the king learns the truth, you may hope for his pardon. But Turin was weary of the elven halls, and he feared lest he be held captive, and he said to Mablung, I refuse your bidding. I will not seek King Thingol's pardon for nothing, and I will go now where his doom cannot find me. You have but two choices, to let me go free or to slay me, if that would fit your law for you are too few to take me alive. They saw in his eyes that this was true, and they let him pass, and Mablung said, One death is enough. I did not will it, but I do not mourn it, said Turin. May Mandos judge him justly, and if ever he return to the lands of the living, may he prove wiser. Farewell. Fare free, said Mablung, for that is your wish. But well, I do not hope for, if you go in this way. A shadow is on your heart. When we meet again, may it be no darker. To that Turin made no answer, but left them, and went swiftly away, none knew whither. It is told that when Turin did not return to the north marches of Doriath and no tidings could be heard of him, Beleg Strongbow came himself to Menegroth to seek him, and with heavy heart he gathered news of Turin's deeds and flight. Soon afterwards Thingol and Melian came back to their halls, for the summer was waning. And when the king heard report of what had passed, he sat upon his throne in the great hall of Menegroth and about him were all the lords and counsellors of Doriath. Then all was searched and told, even to the parting words of Turin, and at the last Thingol sighed, and he said, Alas, how has this shadow stolen into my realm? Cyrus I accounted faithful and wise, but if he lived he would feel my anger, for his taunting was evil and I hold him to blame for all that chanced in the hall. So far, Turin has my pardon. But the shaming of Cyrus and the hounding of him to his death were wrongs greater than the offence, and these deeds I cannot pass over. They show a hard heart and proud. Then Thingol fell silent, but at last he spoke again in sadness. This is an ungrateful foster son and a man too proud for his state. How shall I harbour one who scorns me and my law, or pardon one who will not repent? Therefore I will banish Turin, son of Hurin, from the kingdom of Doriath. If he seeks entry, he shall be brought to judgment before me, and until he sues for pardon at my feet, he is my son no longer. If any here accounts this unjust, let him speak. Then there was silence in the hall, and Thingol lifted up his hand to pronounce his doom. But at that moment Beleg entered in haste and cried, Lord, may I yet speak? You come late, said Thingol. Were you not bidden with the others? Truly, Lord, answered Beleg, but I was delayed. I sought for one whom I knew. Now I bring at last a witness who should be heard ere your doom falls. All were summoned who had aught to tell, said the king. What can he tell now of more weight than those to whom I have listened? You shall judge when you have heard, said Beleg. 
Grant this to me if I have ever deserved your grace. To you I grant it, said Thingol. Then Beleg went out, and led in by the hand the maiden Nellas, who dwelt in the woods and came never into Menegroth. And she was afraid, both for the great pillared hall and the roof of stone, and for the company of many eyes that watched her. And when Thingol bade her speak, she said, Lord, I was sitting in a tree. But then she faltered in awe of the king, and could say no more. At that the king smiled and said, Others have done this also, but have felt no need to tell me of it. Others indeed, said she, taking courage from his smile. Even Luthien. And of her I was thinking that morning. And of Beren, the man. To that Thingol said nothing, and he smiled no longer, but waited until Nellas should speak again. For Turin reminded me of Beren, she said at last. They are akin, I am told, and their kinship can be seen by some, by some that look close. Then Thingol grew impatient. That may be, he said, but Turin, son of Hurin, is gone in scorn of me, and you will see him no more to read his kindred. For now I will speak my judgment. Lord King, she cried then, bear with me and let me speak first. I sat in a tree to look on Turin as he went away, and I saw Cyros come out of the wood with sword and shield, and spring on Turin at unawares. At that there was a murmur in the hall, and the king lifted his hand, saying, You bring graver news to my ear than seemed likely. Take heed now to all that you say, for this is a court of doom. So Beleg has told me, she answered, and only for that have I dared to come here, so that Turin shall not be ill-judged. He is valiant, but he is merciful. They fought, Lord, these two, until Turin had bereft Cyros of both shield and sword, but he did not slay him. Therefore I do not believe that he willed his death in the end. If Cyrus were put to shame, it was shame that he had earned. Judgment is mine, said Thingol, but what you have told shall govern it. Then he questioned Nellas closely, and at last he turned to Mablung, saying, It is strange to me that Turin said nothing of this to you. Yet he did not, said Mablung, and had he spoken of it, otherwise would my words have been to him at parting. And otherwise shall my doom now be, said Thingol. Hear me! Such fault as can be found in Turin, I now pardon, holding him wronged and provoked. And since it was indeed, as he said, one of my counsel who so misused him, he shall not seek for this pardon, but I will send it to him, wherever he may be found, and I will recall him in honour to my halls. But when the doom was pronounced, suddenly Nellas wept. Where can he be found? she said. He has left our land, and the world is wide. He shall be sought, said Thingol. Then he rose, and Beleg led Nellas forth from Menegroth. And he said to her, Do not weep, for if Turin lives or walks still abroad, I shall find him though all others fail. On the next day Beleg came before Thingol and Melian, and the king said to him, Counsel me, Beleg, for I am grieved. I took Hurin's son as my son, and so he shall remain unless Hurin himself should return out of the shadows to claim his own. I would not have any say that Turin was driven forth unjustly into the wild, and gladly would I welcome him back, for I loved him well. And Beleg answered, I will seek Turin until I find him, and I will bring him back to Menegroth, if I can, for I love him also. Then he departed, and far across Beleriand he sought in vain for tidings of Turin 
through many perils, and that winter passed away, and the spring after. <laughs>